Hi, good morning and welcome to this, another of these free introductory classes about local wild herbs that can be used as edible wild foods, as home herbal remedies and herbal medicines in the clinic. And actually today we'll touch on natural skincare uses too, um, because there are so many for this plant. Um, so today we're going to focus on elderflower. I'm Vivian Campbell, I'm a qualified herbalist. I studied herbal medicine and qualified back in 2003. Um, so this is really all I've done with my life for the last two decades or so. And um, all, all my work is working with plants that are medicinal, can be used as wild foods and can be used in natural skincare. And I teach people from total beginners um, to people who are professionals doing specialist training and, uh, and follow on courses in, in little specific areas of it. And um, wh wherever you are on that scale, you're all very welcome. And what all these classes and courses have in common is that they are, we really are looking at local plants and the potential for using them because it's absolutely vast. And I started out as an environmentalist. I joined Greenpeace when I was 12, so that's 30 years ago. And, um, and uh, I really, it just, it, it just, uh, as a child, I could sense the poison that was going on in the earth and how wrong it was. And when you start to learn about local plants and what's around you and how you can use them, it's so exciting but also it changes your perception of where you live. And it doesn't matter whether you live out in the countryside or in the town or the city, you'll find these wild plants growing there and they have so much potential for, for, for use, for enhancing our lives and for us to work with them to create a much, much healthier planet um, because they are absolutely prolific. They are designed to adapt and thrive in adversity. And even when people saturate them in weed killer, they just grow straight back again anyway. So it makes sense in a time, especially where the climate is changing so much and, and the normal crops that are, that are growing um, as food supply and for export in different countries uh, where, where crops are failing be, because the the climate is changing so much and you know countries are becoming too dry it makes much more sense to um look at the wild plants that are growing there already and are thriving because um they're the things that are that are adapting to survive so it makes a lot of sense to look at them and um, because you know, they're the things that are going to keep going and, and we have to, it's it's really important in life to be able to adapt and uh, wonderful things can come out of that. So when you start to learn about local plants, it really transforms your experience of where you live and it makes, in, in, it makes you naturally start to protect what's there. So today we're going to look at elder, um, which is a tree. And you know, a lot of people would cut it down. I, I see a lot of people just describing it as a weed. And especially just now I've seen people say, oh, I didn't realize there's so much that could be used from that and so many delicious things that can be made. Um, I've just always looked at that as a weed. And um, when you start to realize, you know, I think we could spend all day talking about elder, um, and um, but we're going to try and keep it to two hours or less. <laughs> um, the, we, you just realize how much value there is in it. And, and obviously to, to wildlife as well. And um, so instead of cutting down that tree, then you think, oh, actually I'll leave that and I'll, I'll encourage it to grow and then I'll get hedging, you know, I might get, get more of them that will make a, a hedge at the bottom of my garden instead of just cutting it down and putting up a fence. So the more you learn about this, the more you actually improve the environment. I know people say, oh, if everybody foraged and there wouldn't be enough. And I mean, of course, there are, there, there, if people go out and vacuum <laughs> up uh, um, wild plants, then of course there won't be enough. 
but but when you learn properly and you truly start to care for it then actually our world species increase because education improves things for everyone we, we don't do better through ignorance we do better through learning more and when we learn more we realize the value and the benefit of what's around us and we encourage it to grow nature is designed to to grow prolifically and with ease and reproduce with ease uh, and to adapt so um i always say to students look at it you know especially if you've been doing these classes over the last 10 weeks um i know i'm just I, I'm just receiving so many lovely messages from people and it really means a lot to me that you're, you're getting so much out of these classes and, and the courses if you're going on to do those as well. But about how much it's transforming your experience or, uh, and, and how much you're seeing now. And, uh, you know, it's just, um, it's such a hugely beneficial thing for people. So uh anyway let's let's uh, get cracking so has anybody made anything with elderflower i think it's um it, for a lot of people it's the first thing that you start with isn't it do you want to pop into the chat bar if you're making anything and i will have another slurp of this delicious elderflower tea while you're typing <laughs> we'll see who the fastest typist is mm lovely galaxy gem <laughs> not your real name i suspect says uh, he or she has made mead beer and gin oh lovely mead and elderflower fritters you did an infusion with the sweet almond oil oh brilliant oh my goodness oh my goodness oh my goodness okay um loads and loads and loads yeah great so uh you can't identify yeah that's fine so don't worry we're going to come to this uh, the cordial, I love it. Keep on, don't worry about being late, you're fine. Um, okay, just remember, just on a little admin thing, if you haven't, um, if you've missed the other classes and you'd like them, we've looked over the last few weeks at a lot of the things, uh, a lot of the things in here. So we've looked at um, silverweed, daisy, red clover, there's the elderflower, we've looked at plantain. Um, primrose, nettle, dandelion, loads of them. Um, if you'd like the recordings of all of those, there's over 20 hours of recordings of these free classes um, available. So if you just sign up for my newsletter, you'll get an email with um, the link to the free classes. I had to put it into my email automation because um, as those of you who tuned in last week will know, I actually got tendinitis in my wrist from all the copying and pasting the, the messages and the email requests because I've, I've genuinely been getting, I think it's about 350 people a week uh, on looking for the recordings. So I've had to, to put it in, in the email system um, because that's easier for me. Um, okay. Um, I think I found it, I'm not sure. Right, let's let's get through this. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. So the beginning is that the elder is a tree, okay? Um, let me pick out a bit. <clears throat> so these are elder flowers. Now, if you can hang on to if you if you've got time to stay on for the whole class, I will show you the identification video in my um, video course and the close-up photos so that will make it clearer this is just a live stream broadcast the benefit of which is that we can speak to each other live and i can answer your questions so this is an informal chat really but the uh, my video course is um pre-recorded and it was filmed with a professional filmmaker so there's there's really super sharp videos especially for identification and, and a, an outdoor mic so the sound is good and um, i'm just saying this because if you're tuning in on the live stream to this and um, how good the picture quality and the sound uh, will be will depend on how good your connection to the internet is so if you've got um, intermittent Wi-Fi um, and it keeps cutting out or there's you know 10 of you self-isolating in your home and you, it's nine other people streaming Netflix at the same time then um, your, your, um, your reception might not be very good for this but don't don't be disheartened just wait you'll get the email you'll get an email from me about five o'clock today with the recording of this class and that's hosted on my website so it's not a live stream with video and that will play uh, fine for you okay so but i'm just wanting to point out the difference because um the live stream isn't 
is sharp for people usually. So this is a sprig of elderflower. These are the, this is the head of the elderflower. The elder is a tree. So um, one of the things that I'm going to start off with safety, actually, I don't usually start there, but um, it's, it's something that I see in particular related to this because people love to use elderflower. I mean, it just smells, <laughs> it smells wonderful, you know? It's such an uplifting, joyful smell. And um, for me, that's summer when the elderflowers open, that's the start of summer, you know? And um, so, um, however, what, I, what I've found over the last um, maybe four years, at every class or talk or walk or anything that I teach or, or I give, not just online, I mean the things that I teach in person as well and in normal circumstances, I, I teach classes, I've taught classes since 2004. And um, uh, at, uh, inevitably, at, at, at every single class, somebody says to me, Oh, I made elderflower cordial, and but they've not made it from elderflower. They've made it from a random white flower that they found growing, and that is actually potential, potentially deadly. Okay, so the first thing to re to learn about the elder flower, el elderflowers is that they grow on a tree called the elder. And at this time of year, in in depending on the weather and where you are in the world, um, it it grows flowers, it produces flowers, and they're usually there for about six weeks. You've usually got about six weeks where you can have the opportunity to go and harvest elder flowers. And um, the flowers that you don't pick then in the autumn will turn into elderberries. So the elder tree produces elder flower in the summer and elderberry in the autumn. The berries are around for about two or three weeks. Um, but um, just be aware that if you pick if you pick the flowers, then that part won't get the opportunity to turn into a berry. So I'm just mentioning this because if you're short like I am, <laughs> the elder I find is um, usually the ones that are absolutely prolific are tauntingly out of reach. So they're usually surrounded by a huge ditch of nettles to protect them around the bottom. And these huge sprigs of elderflowers, but they're far too high up. So I tend to bring a little step or a little mini step ladder and a walking stick to hook them down so that I can reach them. But if you pick all the ones that you can reach, then just be aware that if you go back in the autumn, then all that will be left are berries and places that you can't reach them because you you know the flowers won't still be there to turn go through their life cycle and turn into berries in the autumn. So, um, so it's the same plant. So just be aware, um, that um, if you do an internet search or um, look at social media or use a plant identification app, and um, these things can be extremely unreliable. And, and over the years, I've seen people make elderflower cordial from random white flowers that aren't from the elder at all. I've, I've known them to make elderflower cordial from valerian, from hogweed flowers, and um, the worst cases, and I've seen this more than once, are people making elderflower cordial from hemlock, which is, hemlock is, is a deadly poisonous. So if they drunk that, they would have been goners, you know? And it's um, the, the, the reason this happens now is because, um, first of all, there's a huge interest in learning about local plants and using them as wild foods and terrible medicines. And that is wonderful, okay? But it's happened at the same time that people have become reliant on technology and just typing things into a search engine and, and looking at the first, you know, usually the first two answers on the first page. So a search engine is not curated. It's not a library, it's a commercially driven force. And so that means that there isn't somebody in control of it, separating out the information that's, that's um, correct from stuff that's wrong. Remember, anyone can put anything up on the internet and anybody does put anything up on the internet. And the, the problem with trying to identify plants that way, if you don't have any basic idea, uh, any basic safety guidelines about how to do that is, if you type in the name of the plant, 
um, you'll get lots of wrong answers. Um, the, the way that we, uh, unlike a book, you know, a book will have gone through a process where it's been corrected and checked up on before it's been printed. And um, the same with teachers, if you come to a class, you know, um, teachers need to have insurance and all sorts of things and be um, responsible and accountable. So they're not going to show you hemlock and tell you that it's an elder flower either. Um, but the, the thing I would particularly like to point out for you about the, the hazards of online searches is that um, when we speak about plants, we use the Latin name of them to ensure that we have, that we're talking about the correct plant because common names for plants vary around the world and, and overlap and refer to different plants. So um, a couple of weeks ago, we, um, whoops, I'm gonna knock over my bouquet here, hang on. We looked at plantain, which is, is this plant, but if you're from uh, Africa or the Caribbean, Plantain is a is a big uh, is the big green unripe banana, you know the savory thing that's fried and it's a really tasty food. So we always use the the Latin name. So the Latin name of elderflower is Thambucus nigra. Um, but the thing to be aware of when you're using a search engine is even when you type in the Latin name, you've got the correct Latin name because of the way it stores information and it stores images, it can still bring up the wrong photographs, but linked to the correct Latin name. So it's, it's not a, a good way to look plants up. Okay, so um, I just want to emphasize that at the beginning because I've seen that wrong so many times with the, this plant in particular. Um, so it's much, much better to get a book and you just need to check that the flowers, you know, if you're doing plant identification, it's easy, you know, once you, once you get the basics, it's really easy. It's like using electricity, electricity, we use it every day without thinking about it. Um, yes, I will put the Latin name in, don't worry. Um, Electricity is obviously potentially lethal, but we all use it every day without electrocuting ourselves because we've been taught from an early age how to use it safely. And um, it's the same with using plants. If you stick to basic safety rules, then the, you know, you're not going to come a cropper. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that about the, the internet searches and the, the, the plant identification apps. Uh, make wild mistakes as well. So take it as a suggestion of what a plant might be, not as a correct answer, because they're they're um, they're they're so frequently wrong. And um, whereas if you get a book, um, you just need to look at the flowers and say, are the flowers the same shape? Have they got the right number of petals? If you're looking at a, a plant and it's got round petals, but the photograph has got pointed petals, then it's not the same plant. Um, are the leaves the, sh the same? You know, it's just really basic stuff. Just all the bits need to match. If they don't all match, then it's not the same plant. But the elder is really, really distinctive. So um, I'll, I'll, um, so it's, it's an easy one to recognize. Can I spell the Latin name? Yep, I'll just pop it into the chat bar for you. And don't worry, I'll, that will go around in the email with the recording. So it's Zambucus, um, Zambucus Negra, there you go. Um, do you know what I'll do? I'll just go into my course and I'll bring up the identification photos for you just now because there's lots of you who on who um, don't know how to identify it. So just bear with me a moment. I'll log into that and I'll screen share it for you. Um, I don't usually do all this safety stuff at the beginning of these free classes, but I think it's really important to emphasize with the elderflower because um, as I said, I just see people make mistakes with this plant, this plant in particular, loads of times. And um, it's just because people are enthusiastic. And if you've got a teacher, a teacher will spend time saying to you, it's a tree, look for the flowers at this time of year and point out really basic identification things, but a search engine, a social media post um, and an app won't do that. So don't be afraid, you know, um, it, I'm, I'm here to help you, you know, this is the point of it. But I, if you, if you know, an, an internet search won't say, 
by the way, there are lots of wild white flowers in the ditch and some of them are poisonous and they're not elderflower. You know, an internet search won't tell you that because it's not a teacher. <laughs> okay, right, I've logged into my course, so I'm just going to pull this up for you um, to screen share. Hang on a minute, um, let me get you back again. That is not what I am looking for. Close tabs, yes. Um, where are you? Here, okay, right, so just bear with me. So somebody's asking, where are you likely to see it? You'll see elder anywhere. Um, if you live out in the countryside, you'll see elder. If you live in the city, you'll see elder. If you're going along in the train, you'll see elder growing along the side of the, the train tracks. Um, could somebody type into the chat bar and let me know that you can see this uh, screen share, please? Um, it always delays. Yeah, raised hands. Hang on a minute. Thanks. Q and A. Got you. That's the air dryer question. Great, brilliant, super, super duper. Oh, hi, Laura. How are you? <laughs> There's another person who's hooked. <laughs> okay, so this is my elderflower lesson in my video course. Okay, so in my video course, we're starting at the end this week. In my video course, I've got identification videos because books are great and I love sitting down reading information, but videos are wonderful for identification because even when photos are really good in books, there's only so much information that you can get across in one or two photos. Um, a video is great because it gives you the environment that the plant grows in. It gives you the scale. I'm in the videos to give scale. I'm only five foot two. Um, and, uh, you know, they just tell so much more. So here we are. I'll just switch this on. Uh, I'll mute it because otherwise you'll have this accent saying two different things at the same time, which is hard work. So this is an elder tree. This is it growing out in the countryside, but it's very, very common in the city. And um, as I'll come on to tell you today, I used to use it a lot when I lived in, in the city. It just grows everywhere. That's why a lot of people think of it as a weed. It's unusual to think of a tree as a weed, but some people um, really dislike it and they're completely wrong, of course. <laughs> so here you can see there's a, it, it's got quite, we're going to, get in for a close-up on the video. Don't worry if you can't make it out just now. It's got quite distinctive um, clumps of flowers. The way that they sit is very distinctive. There are uh, other trees that have little bunches of white flowers, but really nothing else that's this shape. Um, you can enlarge the, the video to make it full screen. I've kept it small screen here so that I don't lose you on the webinar. They are the buds of the elder flower. So that's the buds before they've opened up into the flowers. And then there's the clumps of the flowers that have opened. Uh, so you'll see the clusters of them. So they're very different. The only other trees really just now that are flowering with white flowers at the moment are um, hawthorn, which we've looked at in one of these free lessons as well. And um, although the Gales blew them away where I am. And uh, the other one that's coming out just now is um, the cramp bark, the gelder rose. But the, although they're white flowers on a tree, they're, they're a very, very different shape, okay? So we get in in the video and we look at them in, in detail as well. And we look at the leaves in details too. So here's a, there's another elder tree that again, that one is growing out in the countryside. In fact, that, this very flower has been picked from that very tree. Uh, and you can look at the close-ups of the, the leaves as well. Does that help people? Does that help you with the identification of the elder flower? The rowan tree, yes, thanks. The rowan tree is flowering just now as well. Um, I, I don't have any out here because I'm in the countryside, but if you're in the city, you'll see the rowan tree flowering. But again, the flowers are a different shape and the leaves are a different shape too. Is everyone okay with that? Does that help? Massively helpful, great. Are your ID videos available? They're available in my video course. So if people uh, enroll in my course and all of that's available, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Every plant in my course has got an identification video and uh, close-up photos and things. Um, okay, 
would smell it in the air. Yeah, the smell of elder is really distinctive. Obviously, that's not something I can get across to you on a, on a video. Um, but if you come to a walk or a class in normal circumstances, you know, the smell of elder is really distinctive. There isn't anything else that smells like it. So um, is that OK for everyone? Yeah, I'm just going to go back through. There's loads of comments have come in. So I just want to check I've not missed any questions. Um, uh, somebody's asking about do you, is it the black leaved elder with the pink flowers you've got um, as far as I know you can use those as well as long as it's Sambucus nigra it's a different variety I haven't ever used it um, okay 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 hi Maria right grand okay Loads, right, there's loads of stuff come in here. Okay, right, I'm just going to crack on talking about the different extracts. Is that all right? So did that help with the identification? Are you happier about that? Grant. So let's start with it as a food. Um, I think it, this, is, um, this is one of the most pleasurable plants to learn about because there are so many ways that you can use it and um i you know i seem to discover something new with it every couple of years and this is why <laughs> this is such a rich and rewarding hobby or you know if it's your work your work but it's just such a delightful interest to have in your life because it never ends because there are so many excuse me there are so many plants that can be used as wild foods and herbal medicines and so many different ways to use them. You can just really never be bored with it. But the elder is one where um, you could, you could, um, you know, you could spend a month cooking with it and there'd still be more things to try. So um, has anybody made um, the fritters? I know Emma was on and Emma was saying she's made the fritters. So, the fritters are, are um, absolutely delicious. You just, um, you even just leave the stalk on. We don't eat the stalks of the elder. We use the flowers and whenever we're making an extract, we try and remove as much of the stalks as we can. It's the same if you're using the berries. Um, the stalks do have a chemical in them. I forget which one I actually, I should know that off the top of my head, but I've forgotten. Um, that's that's no good for us. So anyway, so we remove the stalks, and um, it's the same in the bark actually, or, and the leaves of elder too. Um, they they are um, so it is cyanide, isn't it? Yeah, thanks. I doubted myself there, but it is. Yeah, yeah. So the so the so the stalks and the the leaves and the bark have got, um, I suppose, actually, I don't know why I forgot that because I was speaking about it in the, one of these recently. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, um, so they're so mildly poisonous. So we don't use those things, okay? So it's just the flowers and the berries. So we try and remove as much of the stock as possible. Yeah, I told you I saw somebody, a restaurant, saying they were doing kebabs and they were serving the the, the kebabs on on um, branches of elder and I wrote to them and said please don't do that the bark is poisonous you know oh. <laughs> anyway <laughs> thankfully I saw that post before anybody was served or done it on it um, so um, so the flowers um, uh, so we try and remove as much of the stock as possible, but when you're making the fritters, you just make a batter and you dunk the, the flowers in the batter and you, you um, deep fry it or just make sure that they're covered in, in oil and then you can lift them out of the oil and snip off the stalks and just serve them with a little drizzle of syrup or honey and lemon and they're absolutely delicious. They are just delicious it's such a lovely thing to make um, really really beautiful um, can we eat the fruits and um, you can use elderberries but not use the fruits raw because again the, the seed in the middle of the the berries will give you an upset stomach so um, if you're uh, all right, there's loads of comments coming in. I'll come back to them. And um, th so the seed inside the berries, again, is mildly poisonous. So you need to either cook the, you need to strain out the seed before you use it. This is just relevant to the berries. 
Um, so if you make a tincture or a cordial or anything with the berries, the, the seed is removed. So don't worry about that. But don't eat the berries raw. A lot of people do that and put them into smoothies and then have very upset stomachs. So, so don't do that. Yep. Um, the recipe I'm explaining is elderflower fritters. So the flowers are dunked in batter and fried and served. Snip the stalks off after you've cooked them and serve it with some honey or lemon. Um, really, it's really, really tasty. It's lovely. Um, and uh, so it's a lovely thing to do. I also love making the infused honey. Has anybody made that? Um, I've spoken about infused honeys quite a bit in these classes over the, uh, the last couple of months. I've really got into them because they're so much easier than making cordial <laughs> and I don't, need a, I don't need an extra fridge to store honey because the honey is just fine. It doesn't need to be refrigerated whereas the cordials do. Yes, it's gorgeous, Pauline says. It sure is. So um, I've got infused honeys here. The elders only just opened here in the, sort of in the last 24 hours, so I haven't had time to make my elderflower honey yet. But this is this is an infused honey of red clover. So to make an infused honey, you just get a clean, dry jam jar. Put your fill your jam jar full of your herbs. So I've made this one with red clover. And um, so for the elderflower, you would snip off. You do want to remove the stalks, remember, of the elderflower. So just pick the flowers off. And uh, it takes a little bit of time to remove them from the stalks. Um, I find the easiest way is just to rub them and they come off. Um, you can uh, strip them off with a fork as well. Um, <clears throat> and um, put, them into the, put them into a jar, pour on the honey, and let it infuse for usually two weeks and strain it off and use it. Um, yeah, it's the fresh flowers that I use in the honey. Uh, someone's asking, do you need to dry the flowers first to prevent botulism? Um, I just, but I haven't had, I think if you were storing it for a long time, that would be something to be concerned about. Um, certainly with infused oils, um, I would always dry the flower first before making an infused oil. Um, but the, the infused honeys are usually done with the fresh flowers rather than the dried ones. Um, oh my goodness, <laughs> the smells in here. So this is the red clover honey. So what I would suggest is you do a small amount and strain, strain off the, the flowers and use your honey, you know. So I make infused honeys with um, honeysuckle, roses, elderflower, primrose, red clover, any flower really that's, um, that's, that, that lends itself naturally to the sweet taste. And um, I don't keep them for years, you know, so I, I do tend to use them uh, fairly quickly. Um, so that's, yeah, I don't know that they would work as well with um, dried flowers. <coughs> I think I think that's something that tends to develop as it gets older. I still have some from last year. I shouldn't use it now. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of at your own risk, really. <clears throat> it depends how, how healthy you think you are, I think. Um, so I tend to use, I'm a big fan of just making small amounts of things. So if you get a basket of red clover or elderflower or whatever, if you've got four different um, if you've got four different jam jars, then fill, fill each with your herb, you know, your, your elderflower or, or your red clover or your daisy or whatever. And you could do a vinegar, a honey, um, a tincture, um, do a different, and an oil, do a different one with, with each jar. And then you get a small amount of, of everything rather than an enormous batch of things. I think that's another thing with the cordial is you tend to end up with about 40 bottles of it. And for all I'm sitting here and enthusing about infused honeys, I don't really, I don't have a sweet tooth. So I find it quite hard to get through, <laughs> through all the cordial and, and it's all the storage space that requires for, for keeping it as well. Um, I'm vegan and I don't eat honey, but I might try it with agave syrup. Yeah, if you're vegan, um, obviously the cordial is fine because it's made with water and sugar and uh, citric acid or lemons. 
Um, so they're vegan. Um, but yeah, you could try it with agave syrup. I just don't know how good that is as a preservative, how long it would work for. So, um, so the infused honeys are, are lovely and they can be used on their own, but I think they're especially beautiful on desserts. So you can serve them on pancakes, you can serve them over ice cream. Um, I think I saw somebody else say it in the comments at the beginning. Um, I love making a, a drizzle cake, like a, a lemon drizzle cake, but with the elderflower infused honey on top. And it's, it's really, really special. Is anyone here who was at my class in, uh, Glass and last, which unfortunately I've just had to postpone uh, uh, for this year. But um, in Glass and last June, uh, around midsummer, and I had it. You were there, Lorena. Great, yeah. So we had lemon cake, and it was infused. I made the lemon cake infused with lemon balm, uh, and uh, had elderflower honey on top of it. I, I think I made that cake for the aromatherapy uh, class I taught as well that month. Yeah, I did. I remember bringing it all the way from Claire to um, to Leak Slip. <laughs> anyway, but the, the elderflower honey really, really lifts it. So it's just, it's such an easy thing to make, but it really, really lifts your dishes. The other thing you can do with the infused floral honeys is put them into, if you, if you drink alcohol or mocktails, is put them into a gin and tonic. It's just gorgeous. Really, really special. Um, and it's, when you do that as well, it really connects you to the season, you know, especially if you just make small amounts of things. Um, I use the infused honey as well and make chocolate truffles with them. That's another thing. That's another recipe that's in my video courses. Did I serve you chocolate truffles? Who's on who's eaten my chocolate truffles at a foraging walk or something or a class? Um, I make the rose infused honey and put it through the the chocolate truffles, that's really nice too. Um, so, shall I come on to the cordial? So the cordial then, um, I gather Mary Berry has been telling people to freeze elderflowers. <laughs> I got up to loads of messages about that this morning. So I, um, I, I, I haven't tried that, but I, I, don't, I don't recommend it because when you freeze herbs, they go really watery. And um, when things get too watery, what happens is the extracts that you make with them go off really quickly because there's the ratio of water to preservative is wrong. And, um, and there isn't enough preservative basically. So mold, bacteria and yeasts grow rapidly and they ferment and go off really quickly. So, and, and also when you, when you freeze herbs, they, you, they lose their aroma and their flavor. So, um, what I find is a much better thing to do is actually to make the cordial and freeze the cordial rather than freeze the herbs. It's the same with the elder berries. I would make the cordial and freeze the cordial, not freeze the, the berries. Um, so I am going to disagree with Mary Berry on that one. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I don't think it's good. I, I have done, I've tried it, you know, I've, I've tried it and I've had it go wrong. The only time I've ever had a tincture, I'll tell you what a tincture is. Don't, don't worry, I'll come on to different types of extracts and what they are. But a tincture is a medicinal herbal extract. And um, I, the only, uh, tinctures do not go off, they keep for years. And the only time I've ever had a tincture ferment and explode was when I used berries that I'd refrigerated or, or put in the freezer. And it's because they become too watery, which dilutes the preservative. So the preservative in a tincture is alcohol. The preservative in a cordial is the sugar. So that brings me on to the next point. People will then go wrong with the cordial because they'll see oh my goodness, look at all that sugar. That's horrific. I couldn't possibly use that. And they'll put in less sugar and your cordial will start to ferment and go moldy with, within days if you don't have enough sugar in it. So I do not have, um, I, I'm 42 next month. I don't have any fillings, okay? I, 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 I um, don't have a sweet tooth. I don't take much sugar in my diet at all. But when it comes to, to flower cordials, you have to use the correct amount of sugar because yes, sugar is sweet, but it's, it's preserving the extract and cordials are made with water. And water 
um, contains oxygen and bacteria love oxygen they need it there for them to grow and so if you if you don't have um if you make a tea uh, i've got tea here to show you and i'm going to show you how to use the tea actually as a really nice treatment um, be, before we we finish um because i need it to cool down so i don't burn myself um but uh, the 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 a tea will go off okay so Here's here's my this is my elderflower tea. Apologies from for my um, the state of my pot. Um, I did look to see if I had another one, but it's obviously been smashed again. I get through a lot of these pots. So herbal teas, the easiest way to make a, a, a herbal drink or a medicinal tea is um, is to put the herb in water to make a, a herbal infusion. Or a, which is a strong herbal tea and what I recommend you get if you want to make herbal teas is one of these cafetiers and keep it just for making herbs have a separate one for coffee otherwise your herbal teas will taste slightly of coffee and that will just be rank you know so have, have a have a coffee cafetiere and a herb cafetiere I just want to apologize for this one because um, it looks a bit dirty it's actually my there's loads of lime in the water where I live so it's it's just actually the, the residue from the the lime um, in, in my uh, in my water anyway pop the elderflower in the pot Pour on boiled water and let it stand. And really, you can you can let the elderflower infuse from anything for five minutes to several hours. And um, herbal teas, especially fresh elderflower herbal tea, they really taste delicious. I don't know what they put. Has anybody tried those elderflower tea bags that you get from the health food shop or the supermarket? I don't know what they put in those, but I've never tasted elderflower from them. It takes a lot of herb to make a medicinal strength herbal tea. So that's why one of those pots is good because you can use a teapot, but the herb actually gets jammed in the spout and it's difficult to pour. If you get one of those cafetiers, then you can push it all down. You push down the bulk and it's easy to pour. Um, but Herbal teas don't contain a preservative. So if you're drinking them, you need to drink them within 24 hours. They're just made with water. So as I've said already, and I'll come back to the context of the, the elderflower cordial, um, water contains oxygen, bacteria need oxygen to grow. So bacteria multiplies rapidly. So you need to make sure from the minute you make the tea, the, the bacteria will start to grow. So you need to make sure that you've drunk your tea within 24 hours. After 24 hours and up to 48 hours, it's safe to use on your skin and your hair. And I'll, I'm going to finish off the class by showing you that later on. Um, so the difference then between the tea and the cordial, um, you know, you're not going to make tea on a Monday morning and, and drink it on a Thursday. You know, you, you wouldn't do that with a cup of tea with the tea bag, you know, ordinary tea that you put milk and sugar in. We know that's not safe for us to drink. Um, so the difference between the tea and the cordial then is, is the vast amount of sugar that goes into the cordial and the sugar is acting as a preservative. Now, it's a huge amount of sugar and I do recommend, and I, I, I always can't quite believe I say it, <laughs> but I do recommend that in this instance you use refined white sugar because if you use brown sugar or muscovado sugar then the this the rich flavor of the sugar will overpower the delicate flavor of the flowers i recommend that when you make cordials you 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 regard them as a special treat that they are and they are they are a special seasonal treat that is delightful and refined white sugar will really bring out the delicate flavor and aroma of the flowers if you use a brown sugar it's going to overpower that now remember when for all its heaps and heaps of sugar that goes into making the cordial when you dilute the cordial because cordials are always diluted with you know cold still water or sparkling water or soda water whatever you want to use to dilute them it's actually between half a teaspoon and a teaspoon in a tall glass of water. That's the amount of um, sugar that's in it. So it's much smaller it, and, it's, and it's something special that you have. So it's, 
it, there's a big difference. I know sugar is a, is a huge issue. Uh, Overconsumption of sugar is a huge issue in diet, but there's a big difference between having a teaspoon or half a teaspoon of sugar diluted in a, in a drink, you know, a few times a year as a treat uh, or, or in a dessert compared to having a sugary breakfast cereal every day that contains three heat tablespoons of sugar per portion. Yeah. Do you, do you understand the difference? I think regard it as the special treat that it is and, and that's fine and brush your teeth afterwards as well. <laughs> um, somebody said something about ice cubes. Yeah, cordials are gorgeous um, as ice cubes and if you freeze them, freeze a cordial in ice cube portions, it's really handy because one little cube of the frozen cordial diluted with water is, is a portion usually so it's a very very handy way to um, preserve your cordial without the need for bottles and sterilizing things as well it's really really good um, is elderflower good for rheumatic arthritis do you mean rheumatoid arthritis or do you mean rheumatism could you come back to me with that please because they're two different things can we cook the flour and the leaves as a vegetable? The flowers I mentioned earlier are really good as a fritter. The leaves are poisonous though, so don't use the leaves. Um, what's a good tea blend? How much of the stalk do we remove, please? Definitely remove the big bits of the stalk. It gets more difficult with these little fine bits. Just try and get rid of as much of those as you can. Don't, don't lie awake at night worrying about it. Um, a good tea blend with elderflower. It just elder is something that works well in a tea blend and will give a nice flavour to a tea blend. It's really nice with um, red clover, with uh, lemon balm. Um, there's loads of things that combines well with. If you've got hawthorn flowers still out just now, that might be nice too. Um, yeah, it's, it's like roses, elderflower and roses. Oh, elderflower and roses. So with the cordial as well, um, with the cordial, don't worry if you need to leave, it's fine, you'll get the recording later. With the cordial as well, it's quite nice once you get the hang of making the cordial to, to um, do it with other herbs as well. So um, I quite like, I made um, elderflower and red clover cordial a couple of years ago, and I really liked the flavor of that because it was less sweet I, the, the red clover made it less sweet. I, I do find elderflower cordial a bit sickly, so, um, but it's lovely. It's lovely made with um, roses as well, and it would probably be really nice with lemon balm too. I haven't tried that. Uh, a dash of cordial is lovely in Prosecco or a gin and tonic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have mugwort in my beer. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, look at you. I wish mugwort grew in the wild where I am. I love mugwort and it just grew by the side of the road and the river. It was everywhere in England. I, I didn't, I don't remember noticing it in Scotland, but I might not have noticed it there. But certainly when I lived in England, it was everywhere and uh, just don't have it here. Just started a sugar detox yeah yeah so I mean if you don't want to use sugar don't make cordial there's loads of other things that we can make so let's turn let's come on to the other things that we can make with the uh, elderflower that aren't sweet because there are loads of them yes rheumatoid arthritis right I'll try and remember to come back to your question about rheumatoid arthritis I wouldn't do it just now because um it, it, I just want to talk about the extracts just now so um, obviously elderflower tea doesn't contain any sweetener, so that's absolutely lovely to make and it's a very, very effective way to take elder. Um, another thing that's nice to do with it is a vinegar, an infused vinegar. Um, so get your fresh elder, take another clean dry jam jar. Um, this is one that I've made with red clover and um, so you'll know red clover, I'm sure this is the, the red clover flower we did. Sorry, just trying to focus it. There. <laughs> we did a class about red clover a couple of weeks ago. Um, so just get your clean, dry jam jar, put, fill it with the elderflowers, strip them from the stalks and pour on White wine vinegar would be the most delicate vinegar, so that will help to bring out the delicate flavor of the elderflowers. 
let it infuse for two weeks and strain it off and that's your infused vinegar of elderflower so that's a nice uh, culinary ingredient that's, that's sugar free as well and um, like the herbal tea the infused vinegars are a bit of a crossover between a herbal medicine or a, just a nice culinary uh, just something nice to eat because it tastes good you know or drink because it tastes good so um, the difference between the in the infused no the flowers just are fresh for the infused vinegar that's fine although the, you can use dried elderflower as well but it's fine to make them with fresh flowers um the the herbal teas and the infused vinegars the difference between whether they are being used as a herbal medicine or uh just a, a tasty wild food is is the dosage so that's the strength that you take the amounts that you take and how regularly you take it for and, and the length of time you take it for. So the same extract can be used in two different ways, just to flavor food and also um, just um, uh, to actually try and treat something. Does anybody use elderflower as a, as a medicine? Should we start to talk about the, the herbal medicine uses of elder? Somebody's asked me to, I'll show you my drying herbs thing. So you can use fresh herbs or dried herbs and drying herbs, yeah, cold and flu remedy, absolutely. Um, drying herbs is a great way to preserve herbs. So her herbal medicine all comes from plants. Plants are seasonal. So, you know, there might only be a month of the year or a couple of weeks of the year where certain plants are in season and, and you have the opportunity to go and pick them. So we make all these different extracts so that we have the medicines available at the time of year where we're sick and we need them. So it's usually the winter, although with elderflower, it's, it's a huge benefit if you have, um, if you have hay fever so um, that is something that we can use just now but drying herbs is a really easy way to preserve herbs and you can use dried herbs to make a lot of um, different extracts you can use them to make the the herbal teas you can use them to make tinctures infused vinegars infused oils and um, lots of different bits and pieces so I like this, this is my uh, dryer over, whoops, this is my dryer over here, um, which has got these layers of um, mesh, it's all made of mesh and it hangs from the ceiling. So I've, and you can throw in herbs of all shapes and sizes into this. So uh, up there I've got cleavers, that's cleavers that I've, that I've that's pretty much dry actually because it's been so hot. Uh, I've got some meadow sweet, uh, in there so that's nice and crispy so that's dried now as well actually uh, and I've just put in a layer of elderflower at the bottom so what I'm going to do is line the ground underneath that with some baking parchment because uh, the elderflowers are really delicate and as they dry they'll start to fall off the stalks. You'll see I haven't bothered to snip the stalks off because the flowers will fall off um, as they dry. So I don't want them to fall through the, the mesh onto the floor. So I'll collect, I'll put some baking parchment underneath it to collect them. Do you wash the herbs before drying them? No, never wash herbs if you're going to, um, if you're going to eat them right away or make something with them right away then, then uh, like if you're going to put something like sorrel into a salad then yet, uh, or daisy, then you wash them. But if you're going to preserve them, then don't wash them um, because you want, if you want to preserve the herbs, then water is the enemy. So we need light and water to help the herbs to grow. But when we're making extracts and we're preserving them, water and light become the enemy. Um, they, they damage the plant and water, if you wash them, then your anything that you try to dry will just turn black with mold because the plant is saturated with water. So you, it's important to try and pick them from a place that's um, as clean as possible. It's much easier to do that with trees than it is with um, plants that grow down on the ground. Um, really with trees, you just need to pay attention and make sure that um, you're not picking something that's been splattered with bird poo you know um so 
Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's a good question. I'll come on to that. Um, so, so, so pick them on when we're picking herbs. We pick them during a spell of dry weather. It's not good enough if it's dry today, but it's been raining for four days beforehand because the plants will be saturated with water. And again, this will, I'm sorry I keep laboring on about water, but it really does cause a big problem with extracts if there's too much of it. So, um, so the plants will contain too much water in them and anything you try to make with them will, will go moldy or will ferment. So we're, you know, we're getting much drier summers now over the last, they started in 2018, but prior to that, the summers had been terrible, you, you know, really where I live, they've been very dark and very cold and very, very wet. So it was very hard to make things like elderflower lemonade or cordial because they would just ferment and, and explode because the plants themselves were, were saturated. Elder is naturally covered in yeast. Um, plants, most plants, especially fruits, are, if you don't spray them with things, they're naturally covered in yeasts and probiotics and things. Um, if, if everything was gardened organically, we'd be receiving probiotics by um, eating fruits that hadn't had the natural yeasts and good bacteria um, stripped from them. But elderflower is um, natural is covered in wild yeast, and that's one of the reasons it's so easy to ferment into alcohol, into champagne, and beers and things. Um, so anyway, we don't wash the herb. Um, we pick them in the middle of the day as well, so that the dew has evaporated from the plant, and uh, and also that's when the flowers are at are, are at their most open. If you go out early in the morning and the sunlight hasn't reached them, then a lot of flowers like dandelion and daisy and speedwell and things won't have opened up yet. So you, you want them in the middle of the day where they're open and radiant and showing themselves beautifully. Um, and they'll be at their most aromatic at that stage of the day as well. Um, and I love these air dryers. I'll send this round to you with the link with the recording because um, there are lots of different ways to dry herbs and I've gone through lots of laborious ways of doing them over the last 20 years and where I find something that works well and is inexpensive that's what I tend to stick with so these drying racks are about um, 30 pounds or 40 euros and they're they're really really good um, and handy to have um okay yeah this is a good question from Jerry so slightly unrelated to elderflowers but if I gather herbs so be like cleavers and nettle and things that have cuckoo spit on them uh, should I wash it so it's not I know that sounds really <laughs> that's where you look at herbs on the ground and they've got like little bubbles it looks like little bubbles of water on them it's um it's actually secreted by an insect it's not cuckoos going around spitting on things I know that's what the common name is I would just, if I was drying them, try to remove that bit because it's damp. But if I was making fresh herbal tea, I, I would just rinse that off and put it in the pot. I'm sure I frequently don't rinse that off and consume it anyway. Um, but just try and get bits of the plant that aren't wet if you're if you're going to dry them. But the cuckoo spit for all its cuckoo spit for all it sounds unappetizing. Um, it's nothing. It's absolutely not harmful at all. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Medicinal uses, um, you're welcome. <clears throat> so, elder. We've spoken a lot about hay fever on these classes over the last couple of months. And I know I spoke about treatments to try and prevent them. So nettle and plantain and how they are used uh, as how they seem to have a natural antihistamine effect but it's a preventative treatment. So it depends on you going back in time and starting to take net nettle and plantain um, regularly, usually from late March, the beginning of April. And what we tend to find is if you take them regularly, then your body tends to be less reactive and you have less of an allergic reaction at the stage of the year where the allergens that come out that trigger your hay fever. So if you haven't done that, um, and or the pollen count is just particularly high on separate on certain days, then 
You could find that elderflower brings you a lot of relief um, to your hay fever, and there are several ways that you can use elder. And, and I've um, found it really helpful for hay fever. So um, I know when we talked about nettle and plantain, I told you, uh, and you can go back and watch those lessons. If you sign up for the newsletter, you'll get the email with the nettle and plantain lessons as well. So if I'm not going into that in enough detail just now, just go back and watch those lessons and the recordings. Um, with, um, I, as I've said to you, I used to, when I was a teenager, I got desperate hay fever. I didn't have it as a child, but I think I was about 15 when I started to get, you're very welcome, go whenever you like. Um, you, you're, um, I started to get terrible hay fever when I was a teenager and uh, my eyes would stream, I'd want to scratch them out, I would lose my voice. And um, so if I've got the, you know, I've really pretty much got rid of my hay fever by doing the preventative. Um, oh, somebody's saying, sorry, if we could not use the cuckoo spitted herbs at all, the little bug is in the bubbles and has a job to do. Yeah, that's, um, that's uh, yeah, it. Yeah, it's the same with the eggs actually on the cuckoo flower. So that's it. If you can try and pick it without those on it, that's it. That's a great. I thought it had just laid. I didn't realize the bug was actually inside it. I thought the insect had just laid that. So thank you very much. That's very helpful. Do you know which bug it is? That would be great. I'll, I'll, I will look that up though. Thanks. And um, so so if you're so if you've got to the stage where your hay fever is streaming then you can tend to find that the elderflower is really, really um, useful to clear it. So the elderflower tea is, is a great thing to try to take to try and relieve hay fever because it helps to break up mucus. And oh, thank you, it's a frog hopper. Thank you. <laughs> a grasshopper. A grasshopper's in the bubble. Wow, I didn't know that. Very interesting. Super, okay, thanks ever so much. Okay, um, so so the elder it, it will tend to help to break up mucus and catarrh. So um, we always call it. Sorry, we've got a side conversation going on about cuckoo spit. Okay, so cuckoo spit isn't the spit of a cuckoo. It's possibly a frog hopper, a grasshopper, a baby hopper, or fly eggs. I don't think it's fly eggs, but I don't know. So there's homework for us all to go and find out which, uh, which insect it is that produces the cuckoo spit. Okay, I'm gonna get back to the elderflower and, and uh, thank you ever so much for that. I'm gonna get back to the elderflower and hay fever. So um, elder is really, elderflower is really useful for breaking up mucus and catarrh. So I know some people have mentioned taking it to treat uh, colds and flus. And I'll talk about that in a bit more detail later. But if you've got hay fever and you know you get that really heavy head and you feel really tired because you're so bunged up, your sinuses are all blocked, then the elder can be really, really helpful to clear that and bring a bit of um, relief. So the tea, again, the, the infusion is a really, really lovely thing to drink. But also what I discovered um, it, through just purely through necessity and um, who was on, who was saying to me? Someone was saying, was it Bernie? Somebody was saying to me yesterday that she does this now and how effective it is and she's delighted. What I discovered purely from necessity was when I was training, when I was studying herbal medicine at university 20 years ago, I still had this dreadful hay fever and um but learned in the class that elderflower was um really helpful to relieve this and i was walking through the city and <clears throat> just the side of the road was covered in elder bushes so i just picked a big bag of it and and uh, i don't even know that i had a bag actually i think i walked a couple of miles home with an armful of it anyway i brought home a heap of elderflower and i was living in a shared student house there wasn't a separate room where i could dry my elderflower or store my elderflower so I just had the, my bedroom that was my everything room that I worked in so I just dumped the elderflower on my desk and um, next to my bed uh, and left it there simply because I didn't have anywhere else to put it and overnight the smell I don't know the oil whatever was released from the elder just into the air cleared my hay fever overnight and when I woke up in the morning I felt so much better 
Um, so just having the fresh flowers near you can quite often help to relieve the, the hay fever. Um, but the other thing I do, the other thing I started to do with it as well was to put the fresh flowers into a bowl of, of boiled water and do a steam with them. So you know the way sometimes if you've got a cough or blocked sinuses, you would put essential oil or what was it when we were a kid? Was it Friar's Balsam? That was the old fashioned thing, wasn't it? Into water, put, your, put a towel over your head and breathe it in so eucalyptus or whatever to clear your sinuses or, or try to relieve a, a cough. Um, so I did this with the fresh elderflower and I found it was really, really effective to help to clear and relieve my sinuses from that allergy. I just found it fantastic. And I've never seen anybody mention um, those in a, in a book. Uh, they're in my book, they're in my course. <laughs> um, but I just found it so effective and it's... Um, free you know if you've got access to picking elderflower and you also don't need to be concerned really about pollution because you're not drinking it as as well you know so i just found that was so helpful and that was just a, a discovery by chance basically because i didn't have the resources to do anything better with it so be better you know and um, so that is just really, uh, I found really, really effective. Right, I'm getting a few different things come in here. When herbs are dried, how long do they, can you store them for? So let's look at dried herbs. Um, so, you know herbs are dry when they've gone crispy. There are some exceptions to that rule. Um, hang on, I might just pick some of it. <laughs> My desk is covered in dried herbs from doing these classes over the last few weeks. So here I've got daisies, and that's daisies that have been dried, and they have gone crispy. Uh, there are some herbs that don't feel crispy when you dry them, like rose petals. That's just to do with the chemicals that are in them and the texture of the petals themselves. But most herbs will feel crispy when they're when they're dried properly then pop them into a paper bag to store them because they'll continue to lose moisture for quite a while that's lemon balm that i've dried uh, so this is uh oops Ugh. that's lemon balm i've picked i picked um about an hour and a half ago before the class so it's starting to wilt because I didn't put any water in the vase just in case I knocked it over. I'm going to, I make herbal tea with my uh, bouquet after the class every morning anyway. Um, so that's fresh lemon balm and then that's how crispy it gets when it's dried. I store them in paper bags because they'll continue to lose water, uh, moisture for quite a while, even after they're crisp. And if you put them into glass jars, right away then you'll trap that moisture and you'll have a jar full of mold so i tend not to put them into jars and until maybe a couple of months later i keep them in the paper bags and fold them over and maybe just put on a, a bull clip to clip them shut or a clothes peg um and actually what what i tend to do with them is just leave them in the paper bags and um, put them into a tupperware box uh, there's the red clover there. They're dry as well from a couple of weeks ago. Um, so it's, it's, it's just easier because glass heats up very, glass heats up very easily as well. So um, the paper bags, it's easier to keep them cool in. And just store them in a cool, dry place out of direct light and out of direct heat. Uh, but most importantly, somewhere dry because um, just remember, I'm sorry I keep laboring over it, but it's, it's important to every stage or after you've harvested a herb, light and water and heat will damage them. If it, if it gets damp where you're drying your herbs, you will lose your dried herbs in the space of a couple of days because mildew spreads through them rapidly. I lost everything I was drying in this a couple of years ago because there was a the seal around the window broke and it, and it leaked and there, it was just raining a lot and that was enough even though it's at the opposite end of the room to the window, that was just enough moisture getting into the room to ruin them. Um, and uh, 
yeah, this is why I'm so, this is why I'm full of warnings about what could go wrong because everything's gone wrong with, with stuff I've, I've done over the last 20 years. So um, that's why I'm always sharing these tips with people to try and spare you these experiences. Um, so just store them in a, in a dark cupboard or in a box and cover them over with something to protect them from the light. And that's absolutely fine, you know. How many heads of flowers do you generally need for different things? Um, if it's the fresh flowers and you're making some tea, then usually just a, a couple of, of, of um, flower heads that size is, is enough, but do it to taste, you know. You'd need to take an enormous amount of elderflower to overdose on it. So um, you can do it to, to taste, that's fine. It's more about taking it regularly if you're trying to take it as a, as a herbal medicine, it's about taking it regularly and consistently, but find the strength that you find palatable and that's the right thing for you to do because that's what you'll actually be happy to drink throughout the day and over a, a period of several days consistently then. Is that okay on the tea and um, drying herbs? Um, I uh, wanted to mention a couple of other things, I think, are there got that question already didn't I yeah okay um so the next way that we can make so, so for the hay fever then the, the easiest thing to do is is pick the fresh flowers and and to make the tea that way and um, but if you don't like tea or you want to preserve them so that you've got the the elder flowers available for later in the year then you can make a tincture and uh here we are uh, a herbal tincture is a herb that has been extracted usually in alcohol, although you can use vinegar as well. And um, okay, oh, that's, I meant in general because people are saying they're collecting 20 to 30 flower heads of elderflower to make stuff. That, I think that's probably for cordial. Um, the recipes for cordial do tend to talk about um, flower heads. So this would count as a flower head, not an individual flower. And they will call for go and get 20 or 30 flower heads and get a big bucket and pour on the water and the lemon and the citric acid. And this is what I was talking about earlier with the cordial is you'll end up with, you know, 30 bottles of elderflower cordial, which you'll, you'll you know, cordial needs to be refrigerated because of the water content. It won't store well, especially in hot weather, um, because of the water content, you need to refrigerate it. So, I mean, if you make loads of cordial and you don't give it away, you do need to get a separate fridge just to store your cordial in it. It's another reason I, I prefer the infused honeys because I don't need to put them in the fridge. Um, but yeah, the 20 to 30 flower heads are usually the recipes for the cordial, you know? Um, so, it, it, but you can have the amount, you know, if you're going to make cordial, get, get 10 flower heads or 15 flower heads and just divide the recipe in two and make a smaller amount. That's so much easier the first time anyway, because with cordials, you need to sterilize the bottles too. So it's actually quite a lot of, of labor. So, um, I'm a big fan of making small amounts, um, because uh, I don't want to drink 30 bottles of cordial. <laughs> Do I have a champagne recipe? I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have that. Um, I have made wines and beers, um, but really it was about 20 years ago I was making quite a few of those and then I was teetotal for a decade and I, so I wasn't making alcohol uh, and um, I, I just lost my equipment, got damaged and I've never replaced it. So um, I don't have um, wine and beer making stuff in my course because I don't, I don't feel that I'm experienced enough making it to teach it. And um, John Wright's, I think it's John Wright who's done that book as well. The, the River Cottage is a good one about brewing and uh, you'll get recipes for elder, I mean, it's easy to get a recipe for elderflower champagne. Yeah, yeah, it's very easy to, to get them. It doesn't take long to, to make at all, but I apologize because um, I didn't drink for ages. <laughs> so I'm a bit out of practice with making things like that. Um, okay, um, so tinctures, 
I didn't drink she then, so showing tinctures, which are flipping made with brandy. But anyway, so tinctures are a way of extracting the and preserving the goodness from the herbs. It concentrates the goodness so that instead of taking having to drink, you know, half a pint or, or half a litre of herbal tea every day. Usually you're just taking teaspoon dosages of the tincture. So you just put the herb into the clean, dry jam jar, pour on the strongest alcohol that you can get. So that's usually brandy or vodka. Leave it to infuse for two weeks and strain it off. And the murky brown liquid is the tincture. So you can tincture elderflowers and, um, but you can make them with um, vinegar if you don't want to use alcohol. Um, they are called vinegar tinctures or simply infused vinegars. And they are usually nice as made with white wine vinegar or cider vinegar. Um, so that's my red clover vinegar that's made with white wine vinegar, um, which I just poured on my leg. Um, that's um, that's a really medicinal looking one. That's made with cider vinegar. That's a really good mineral extract. Oh, you're right. <laughs> that's a really good mineral extract um, of nettles and plantain and blackberry leaves. So that's pretty much ready to strain. So it's really about it being a very good solvent, you know. And uh, alcohol is a very good solvent, and so is vinegar. Um, and preservative so they keep for years you know because vinegar keeps for years and vodka and and brandy nobody's ever opened a bottle and said oh that's old that's gone off I'll pour that down the sink you know they keep they keep for years uh, and um, yeah so they're very handy uh, I've got rum that's 43%. Try it out and see. I have seen some people make them with rum and whiskey um, over the last few weeks um, so yeah, in terms of if if there if the if the percentage is between sort of um, sort of thirty eight percent and forty percent, then usually they're you know that's that's the strength that you're looking for for home tinctures. So go for it. Yep, uh, that's fine. Watch the replay. That's grand. Um, Okey doke. Um, so so tinctures are really handy because they keep for years and. Um, the other, the other medicinal use of elderflower um, that, that it's really good for is for, for treating and relieving colds and flus. So obviously we tend to be more susceptible to those when the weather changes and it gets cold. So that's where it's really handy to have your tincture made or have your elderflower dried and then be able to make tincture with it in the, in the winter or teas. You know, you can make the herbal infusion teas from dried herbs too. And herbal infusions the water teas are very very medicinal a lot of people sort of go oh well they're only tea they can't really be as good as a as a tincture and that's not true at all medicinal teas are, are brilliant medicines and I would argue in a lot of cases they're better than tinctures because if you are drinking half a liter of something every day that is good for you then that's half a litre less of things like tea and coffee. And, and um, I mean, I don't think that many people drink fizzy drinks anymore, but, you know, cans of cola or whatever. It's half a litre less of those things that aren't good for you that you're drinking. So um, I think you get a lot more benefits from drinking herbal tea that way than you do compared to a tincture. But at the same time, you've got to be practical. And if you're just never going to drink uh, herbal infusions especially on a daily basis on a regular basis then take the tincture because that's far better than not taking the medicine at all so in that instance that's the best medicine for you do the thing that you know that you'll do rather than the the unobtainable ideal you know um because it's the thing that you will actually manage to incorporate into your life on a regular basis that will have the biggest impact on your health um, there's no point in saying I'm going to do this thing over here because it's ideal and it's perfect if you know that you'll just never get around to doing it. You know, don't kid yourself on. <laughs> okay, so um, so the tinctures then, it's usually, it depends on the herb you're using, the age of the person, the health of the person, uh, and the reason that you're taking the medicine for, but the dosages tend to, oh, somebody's just written in about dosages. The dosages 
tend to vary for different tinctures from drops to teaspoon dosages. Certainly with elderflower, I'd be looking at teaspoon dosages. If um, somebody has a, a cold and you're trying to fight it off, I would actually take a teaspoon of the tincture every two hours because taking it regularly is the thing that will help to fight it off. Um, just be aware of, um, I don't know if they can go anywhere at the moment anyway, but just be aware of drink driving rules and, and uh, blood alcohol levels um, if you're taking tinctures because obviously they contain alcohol. Um, but if you're staying in bed, not feeling well, then taking the tincture a teaspoon every couple of hours is a brilliant way to fight off um, a cold, uh, you know, in a very short period of time. And it's not just that the sinuses are congested and it helps to relieve the sinuses. What elder does, and this is the flower and the berries, is it promotes sweating. So it's, it's um, called diaphoretic. So a substance that's diaphoretic helps the body to open its pores and sweat and this naturally brings down a temperature or a fever. So um, I know we've, we've, we tend to have been conditioned to go and take a, a pharmaceutical, if we get a temperature or a fever, to go and take a pharmaceutical to bring down our temperature. But actually the advice is changing about that now and uh, we, the advice has always been different in herbal medicine. We tend to work with the temperature because a temperature cooks germs. When we heat something, you know, when we boil something, we know that kills loads of germs, don't we? When we cook something in the oven, we know that kills lots of germs, don't we? So um, when it's the same in our body, when, um, when we, the function of the temperature is to cook the germs to try and kill um, the, the virus or the bacteria that's making us feel rubbish. And um, in herbal medicine, rather than taking something that artificially uh, brings down the temperature. What we do is we give herbs that are diaphoretic. So that's things like elderflower and uh, yarrow. And um, we'll probably look at yarrow uh, in the next month or so. I'm just, the leaves are out. This is, this is yarrow, the leaves are out, but I'm waiting for it to flower so that we can do one of these classes about them because it's easier to identify when it's flowering. Um, but these diaphoretic herbs open up our pores and make us sweat. And that's our body's natural mechanism for cooling down, isn't it? That's what we do in the sun. We sweat, don't we? So it cools us down. And um, so an old treatment for um, a fever or a cold or a flu would be to wrap up well. So I know it sounds ridiculous to talk about it when the weather is so hot. But in the winter, if you can wrap up well, uh, and go to bed uh, with all your layers on. I've been known to go to bed with the woolly hat on. I did used to live in a really old cold cottage, as several of you who are on here today will verify. <laughs> but I just go to bed with a woolly hat on sometimes as well. A couple of cats uh, and, and a hot water bottle and, and uh, drink uh, elderflower tea or tincture or, or yarrow, one of these herbs that has this effect. And what you'll find is, You'll, you'll uh, sweat out the, the, so you've heard of sweating things out. You'll wake up in the morning a sticky, <laughs> unattractive mess, having sweated during the night, but you'll feel a lot better. Um, and, um, and because you've, you've broken the, the bug, the, the fever, and uh, it's killed it, and then go in have a shower and wash off all the, the germs, and uh, you'll usually wake up feeling much, much better. So elderflower is fantastic for, for doing that. It really, really is, as is elderberry in, in the autumn too. So um, they're really, really effective. It's just such a lovely plant to get to know. Yeah, has anybody used it that way? Yarrow is all around my area and easy to identify. That's great. We'll definitely look. I think in the, in the next few weeks, I think, um, hmm. Probably next week, uh, well, so Daisy, this is wilted. We'll be looking, I think we'll look at wild roses and, and uh, well, ro the rose family. So that includes cultivated roses, but roses, but the wild roses have started to open now. So I think we'll probably look at that next Tuesday. Um, so yeah, the elder's just lovely for that. So I wanted to come on as well to um, other ways you can use the, the herbal tea with them. Um, 
uh, elder flower and I'm just going to take the lid off the tea over here so I don't spill it on my computer and uh, fry in a mixture of water and electricity so excuse me for a sec while I disappear. Right here we are so I've got my elder flower tea and um, it makes a lovely, after you've, if you've not drunk it within the 24 hours, it makes a really nice uh, wash for the face. So remember, you've got to use it up within 48 hours if you're using it on your skin. But it makes a really nice toner or just skin freshener. People used to use it to try and reduce freckling. Uh, I don't know why, they were always trying to reduce freckles. Uh, I love freckles, but um, it, it's certainly a nice thing to soften and, and uh, soothe the skin. And so if you haven't drunk your tea within 24 hours, don't feel that you've wasted, wasted it. You can use it for your skin. You can also warm it up or add hot water to it and use it to make a hand bath, which is really lovely and soothing. And you know, most people's hands work hard. Um, if you, you know, most people's hands are exposed to all the chemicals that are in the tap water. So um, there might be chlorine in your tap water, that's very common. Or um, I've got hard water from all the, the lime that's in the area where I uh, currently live. So um, a hand bath of elderflower is a, is a lovely thing. And hand baths are very soothing and relaxing. A lot of people, I mean, herbal body baths are a beautiful way to consume herbal medicine. You can absorb herbal medicine through your skin. So that's a really nice thing to do if um, you uh, don't like the taste of them. Um, herbal body baths can be very effective. But as I know a lot of people don't have baths, if they live in apartments or whatever, a lot of modern houses tragically don't have baths. Um, but um, you can do hand baths and you can do foot baths. And if you've been to a class with me, you've probably tried a foot bath. We do them quite a lot in my classes. And they're very practical because you don't need to go to the effort of running a, a, a bath and you know uh, it taking up all that time and water. Um, you, you can just use a little bowl and, and rest your hands in them or a little basin and rest your, your feet in them. And it's very, very soothing. It's easy to do for, you know, 20 minutes while you're watching some, don't watch the news, uh, but 20 minutes while you're watching something that you enjoy. Um, and uh, they're a remarkably effective way to um, consume your, your, your herbal medicine. They really are. So this is cooling down a little bit. So if I had that in a basin, um, it was a traditional skin softening herb. I know somebody else has asked me about the infused oil. I'll, I'll come on to that now because I'm talking more about skincare things. But I wanted to show you this. So it makes a lovely compress for the eyes. And all you need to do is take a, I'm going to pour. I'm just going to pour myself another cup of this to drink because I don't need that much for my compress. But all you need to do is um, dip your face cloth into the tea or pour the tea onto the face cloth. And uh, so clean face cloth and just make sure it's covered in the tea. In fact, I will just dip that in, that'll be easier. And uh, sorry. So just, just dip it into the tea so that the, the face cloth is covered in it and squeeze it out. And um, sorry, I've got to be so careful doing that so it's nowhere near the electricity. So apologies for that being off screen, but things like that are all on video in the course and just wrap it around and it's lovely on the eyes. It's such a soothing treatment if your eyes are tired, if you've got the hay fever and they've been itchy, um, if you've been working, I think most people are on screens too much and with the dawn of the age of online working, which I've been doing since 2015, but the, the rest of the world is discovering now, um, you know, it's too, it, the computer gets very draining. Um, so something like this afterwards is really, really lovely. It's so therapeutic and there's something about the the warmth. I know I did this last uh, week with the, um, I just feel so lovely, 
last week with the poultice I showed you um, or I talked about making the the daisy poultice for my my uh, tendonitis that I had from all the flipping work on the computer <laughs> it's the mouse it's the click and paste uh, it's the mouse action that seems to be doing it anyway um, the warmth, I like herbal medicine. If you learn herbal medicine, it, it really modern herbal medicine focuses on internal treatment. Which there's, you know, if you want to sort something out, and I know somebody asked about rheumatoid arthritis, I'll pick up on on uh, that in this section now. You know, most treatments it's sorting things from the inside out, but there's so much care. Uh, that goes into a, a poultice or a compress. They're deeply therapeutic, especially the, the warmth of them. I think heat is a lovely thing and it helps the medicine to penetrate to where it's needed. So yeah, this just this thing with the eye compress is really, really lovely. And uh, I think I talked about it as well in the silverweed lesson with the varicose vein poultice or the the poultice for hemorrhoids. They are things that are in that are in my video course, and um, guessing this would be nice on an eye with a cold sore. I would be very careful with that, actually, Pauline, because um, cold sores are so contagious. I wouldn't actually recommend putting that onto a cold sore because they're so easy to spread around. Um, you'd need to be really, really careful that you didn't spread that around and end up with more more cold sores from them. I'm sorry, I, jinx I jinxed us last week, didn't I, talking about cold, I had been asked about it, we, we had a webinar last week from my students doing my video course and I was asked about cold sores and I seemed to <laughs> give a big lesson about those and then and then within a couple of days uh, a couple of people had cold sores again who hadn't, uh, hadn't had them for ages, I think it was just thinking about them seemed to bring them out again. <laughs> Anyway, um, because cold sores are a weird virus like that, there's some psychological link with them, that's for sure. But yeah, that is just absolutely lovely on the skin, and it is so soft, and um, I can't even go on like this now. I've just had that on for a minute while teaching, while still talking. It's really beautiful. So again, same if you've got sore hands or um, tired hands, and you've been doing loads of dishes, Treat yourself with your leftover herbal tea, you know, and just have a hand bath. It really is deeply relaxing. Ditto a foot bath, really lovely stuff. Yeah, yeah. Is that okay? Um, I just wanted to point out as well with um, the, um, the, the um, skin care. Elder is a traditional one that was, that was used to make all sorts of different cosmetics. And it was used to put into moisturizers as well as a cold cream. So a cold cream is a water and oil and usually bees, well, yeah, LI seemed to prevent, yeah, we, 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 we did a big thing about that last week um, to prevent cold sores, thanks Kay. Um, so um, uh, cold cream is traditionally an oil, a water and beeswax to, to solidify it. So it can be made with elderflower tea or elderflower distilled water, elderflower infused oil and beeswax. It's just, um, <laughs> it's just going, it's, it's just, um, it's a lovely skin softening cream. It's just to be aware if you're, if you're making emulsions at home because they don't have a preservative in them, they will go moldy really quickly. But um, who asked about, here, somebody asked about infused oil. I got an email about it, elderflower infused oil. And I think Sally asked earlier on, so I hope you're still here. I can't actually see all the names of everyone that's, still here, there are lots of people still here. Um, but this is an infused oil. This is the one that I made last week in the class with the daisy. So again, you can make an infused oil with elderflower. So dry the elderflowers first, <clears throat> pop them into the clean dry jam jar and pour on your base oil. So I use sunflower oil. Great, hiya Sally. Uh, I use sunflower oil, but you can use almond oil or um, all sorts of different base oils. If you'd like to learn more about that, maybe go back and watch the daisy, the recording from the daisy lesson last week, because I did talk about that in more detail then. Um, but you can do the, the um, elderflower um, infused oil the same way. And then you've got a lovely, a infused oil to use in in um, in skincare and it's 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 beautiful as well, very aromatic and really softening. 
Um, so yeah, there's there, there are all sorts of really nice things that you, you can do with them. Just be aware, if you see a recipe <clears throat> talking about distilled water or, or elder water, it's usually not elder tea they're talking about. It's the distilled water, which is a hydrosol or a hydrolat. And they're collected by in distillation equipment and they're much more concentrated and they've got a lot less bacteria in them than a herbal tea because they have been distilled, uh, which means they've been heated. So a lot of the germs have been cooked and they've been bottled in a way that um, prevents, uh, helps to slow down the rate at which bacteria and molds and yeasts will grow in them. Um, so if you see a recipe talking about elderflower distilled water, it's usually the hydrosol rather than the tea that they're talking about. So there's a, bit, there's a big difference in terms of shelf life with those. Um, Do all herbs have to be dried before preservation? No, you can use fresh herbs to make tinctures and infused vinegars. Um, if you're making infused and, and infused honeys, if you're making infused oil, then dry them first. I, I'd like you if, you, if you want to learn more about, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. If you want to learn more about making infused oils, please go back and watch the recording from the daisy lesson because I spoke about it in a lot of detail last week and I'm running out of time so I just don't have time to go into it in that level of detail just now because we've talked about a lot of other things with the elderflower. Is that okay? Um, but even just try, if all you take from this, if you feel that you're able to identify the tree and you notice it near you and, and you pick a few clusters of it, it please try the tea and please um, try the leftover tea. Try it as a drink and try the leftover tea as a hand bath or an eye compress. It's just absolutely beautiful. It's a really lovely thing to do. And uh, you, you know, I, th I think that's a, a really, it's a really nice, simple thing to um, do with the elderflower. The other way I found the elder um, really useful, which again, I've never seen in a book. I think it was a herbalist that I did a class with in the late nineties, just before I started studying herbal medicine, who taught me this is, it's very protective and soothing on the throat. It, it, it seems to, it's all the sinuses and the cells that line the, down the throat and the tops of the lungs. And um, I used to recommend it to people if they, were, if they were giving up smoking to try and help these cells recover. And, and the hairs, the little hairs that are on these cells, they get burnt if you smoke. And it's one of the reasons that people get a smoker's cough because the little hairs on the cells catch germs and sweep them up and away all the time. But if you're smoking, you sizzle them and you burn them away, you know? So, so the germs get down and, and get caught, but the, the elder seems to help to protect that and, and, and helps the body to recover. So I think it's a really nice thing to use the elder for. Dry herbs for about a week and infuse in oil for about two weeks, is that right? Yeah, yeah, go back and look at the, the oil lesson from the daisy lesson last week, yeah. Um, so, um, but that's that's about right, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so um, if you're drying herbs, yeah, dry herbs, from the minute you harvest herbs, light, heat, and water are the enemy. Dry your herbs out of direct sunlight. You, it doesn't need to be in, in darkness, but it needs to be not in direct sunlight because it will damage, uh, it will just cause a lot of the goodness in the herb to evaporate. We've all seen those little spice racks and hair racks from the from the kitchen from the, the 1980s where people left them sitting in the sunlight and instead of being a vibrant green color the herbs were bleached to sort of pale yellow yeah so um you just lose the goodness from the herbs if you if you're leaving them in the light you want them to be out of direct light and that just means having that thing hung up in the corner of the room that gets the least sunlight and pulling the blinds down that's that's all or pulling the curtains you know can you ingest infused oils? Yeah, if you've made them with dried herbs, then yes. Um, if you've made them with fresh herbs, I'd be reluctant because of the risk of the botulism. But yeah, you can ingest infused oils as long as you've made them with herbs that are edible and a, and a base oil that's edible. So if it's red clover uh, and um, or, or elderflower and sunflower oil, then yep, absolutely, give it a try. They might not taste the greatest, you know, it's, it's oil, but they might be quite nice mixed in a salad dressing, you know. 
Um, okay, so um, we've had loads of questions. Oh, the rheumatism, that was the thing I didn't get back to. So actually, do you know what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll go into the course and I'll show you how the course works and, and, and the medicinal stuff in there because I'll, I'll pick up on it when we get in there if that's all right. So if you are interested, these are just free introductory classes just to open your eyes to some of the plants that are around you. And I can only really talk very generally in these introductory classes uh, rather than get into specifics. But if you are interested in going on to learn about herbs in more detail, including uh, using them as medicinal remedies, what dosage would you take, how often should you take it, uh, can you give it to children, can you give it to people who've got underlying health conditions, um, all of this stuff, I teach it in much more detail in my video course and I've got, uh, you're welcome, get really nice messages coming in, you're really welcome, um, I've got um, loads more stuff in, in my course so um, but it's aimed at complete beginners and you can dip in and out of it so I've got videos showing you how to identify uh, the herbs and close-ups of the photographs and medical safety guidelines and details of how to use them so we'll go in and look at the elder lesson so this is my website theherbalhub.com there's absolutely heaps of stuff on it um, I need to go back and redesign it again. Websites are like the fourth road bridge. They're never finished. <laughs> it's a constant job. You just finish them and then you need to go back and start again. Okay, um, so the video course is in the members area. So if you just click on the members area and um, great, I'm glad you're off to forage. Lots of people went off in the daisy in their lunch last week. So I think people are off to have um, elder in their lunch today which is great um, so you just log in to the course with your email address and password and um, whoops daisy i am um, you don't want a typo on that okay and click login and um <laughs> that's really i'll read that out in a minute thanks okay so that brings you to the members area and there's a wee welcome video there with me explaining how the course works. I've basically typed the same thing there. I produced this course in 2015, so this is actually the sixth year that people have joined it. And uh, surprisingly, it's much more popular this year because um, so many people, you know, online op learning is is really the the only less the only option we've got at the moment. But um, I. Uh, this course became something much bigger than I originally intended and very quickly um, and it's um, really been very rewarding for me because I've taught since 2004 and I've literally taught thousands of people but with the course people can dip in and out of it and come back to it over the years and I really do see and I hear from people about how it's transforming their life and, and the significant changes that, it, that, that, that they've had because they're starting to use local plants and I just I'm very moved by that. So I support this course, I support it with webinars like this where my students can come in and, and um, uh, ask different questions and I also there's a private Facebook group as well for the course where people can share recipes and ask questions. And I support the course because I know that the difference between being able to do something or not is confidence. So we can read it in a book or we can look it up online, but it's not until we try doing it ourselves and then have, when we do the practical thing, we have, we realize we've got a lot more questions about it. And it's, it's doing the practical thing that raises more questions. So I support it because you can't ask a book questions, you know, and if you can ask your teacher questions and your teacher can say, yes, that's fine. No, that's where you, you've gone wrong. If you do it this way or you've read something that's completely contradictory, then, you know, a teacher can say the reason why that person is saying that is because of this. The reason it's not relevant to that is because of this. It's the difference between you getting the confidence to do something and integrate, integrate it into your life or not doing it again because, for the, because of doubt, basically. Anyway, um, the course is divided into the seasons, so spring and early summer, that's where we are, high summer or autumn. If you're tuning in from Australia, start in autumn. Uh, we'll go into the spring one, 
Um, the, at the very top of the course are medical and foraging safety guidelines. So really you only need to look at these the first time that you look at the course. Just click on the lessons and they'll come up. They're not a long thing to watch or read. And then, uh, whoops, what have I done there? We go down to the plant lessons. So loads of the plants that we've looked at over the last 10 weeks in these free classes, plantain, nettle, dandelion leaves, dandelion flowers, primrose, daisy, cleavers, red clover, silverweed, sorrel, hawthorn, elderflower. So we'll go into elderflower because that's what we're talking about just now. And uh, the, every lesson has got the contents at the top. They've all got the identification section. So we've, we looked at that at the beginning of the class and photos. I might put some more photos into that for you actually. And then we come on, so if you joined the class late, just go back to the beginning of the video recording and you'll see me showing the identification stuff. They've all got this plant data sheet, which is jargon free, really basic stuff. What kind of plant is it? It's a tree, um, how to, you know, is it edible? Loads of basic recipes. Can you use it as a food? Can you juice it? Um, and um, then it comes on to, there's cosmetic recipes as well. Um, there's the hand bath and the skin toner and the compress for sore eyes. And then we come on to medicinal uses. So to relieve colds and flus, for hay fever, sinusitis, sore throats, to lower a temperature. So all these things I've talked to you about in the class today. Um, and the external uses. Oh yeah, the compress is really nice on mild sunburn actually. That's another thing that the compress or the skin toner is really nice for if you if you've got mild sunburn because it's so softening and cooling it's really nice uh, and there's the dosages there um, and dosages for adults and children of the tea and the tincture now you can if you don't like reading things on screen I don't either I'm old-fashioned I like books and I like printing things so you can print to, to download the PDF and print it off and that's in black and white as well so you won't bankrupt yourself um, in printer ink but down at the bottom then we've got the recipe and extract videos and I've done loads of them for um, Elder so the first one is the tea and I'm showing people how to use it as a herbal tea and as a compress, compress, compress and a hand bath so the videos are all filmed, uh, most of them were all filmed with, I, I worked with a professional filmmaker, thank you ever so much for all your graft, Fergus, all those years ago. Um, I think we did 110 videos together between um, May and October. Um, I was so fortunate he was available to work with. So it's like a cookery demo, it's very easy to see and there's there's close-ups on the camera as well and I'm, I'm mic'd up so the sound is good as well. There's the elderflower steam treatment that I was talking about for the eyes. There's the fritters, there's the cordial. Now I've kept all the, bit. there are at least 150 videos in my course but I've kept all of them with the exception of the, um, of the webinars because they're an hour, they're the, the, there's always recordings from the Q&A webinars so that people can get answers to their questions if they can't tune in live. But all the actual lesson videos, so all the plant identification ones and the recipe videos are all under 10 minutes and they're all labeled. And the reason is, so it's really easy for you to dip in and out of the course and look things up and go back to them so that you're not having to trail through um, an hour's video to try and hear the two minutes of information that you wanted to hear again because you've forgotten it. So all, I kept all the videos under two, uh, under 10 minutes. So there's the elderflower cordial. I did elderflower and red clover cordial. That's the variation there, um, which I mentioned earlier, which I really liked. Oh, here's my elderflower jelly. Oh, that's gorgeous. That's so easy to do. I mean, look at that. That's stunning, isn't it? And it's pretty much, you know, it's ready in an hour. That is a really nice thing to make. Right, okay, anyway. So all the plant lessons are like that. And um, there's a, a quick skip to the, the extracts. So making tinctures and, and ointments. So tincture making is the same no matter which plant you use. In this video, I've made it with red clover, but you can make it with elderflower, with any plant that you want to use. The same with making ointments. Uh, you make that you dry the herb, 
you make an infused oil and then you use something to solidify it. So in this example, I've got plantain, but you could use daisy, elderflower, cell field, St. John's wort, calendula. Um, there are plantain that are, there are just rose, rose, and rose, oh, rose infused oil. <laughs> There are just loads and loads and loads of them. So once you master the basic techniques for making medicinal extracts and, and making wild foods, then you can mix and match them and the variety really is endless. It's just such a rewarding thing to do. Um, there's the webinar recordings. Um, there are loads of them. I need to go in and reorganize them again because there are four years of them in there. Um, and down at the bottom, there's resources, recommended books, recommended reliable websites. Um, there's where to get equipment and things that you might need, like jars and bottles, dried herbs, packaging. I've got a guide to using herbs in the city, um, loads of other little bits and pieces there. And so it's like that for every course. The summer course has got roses, St. John's wort, calendula, meadow sweet, um, Cell fuel, yarrow, lemon balm, ras wild raspberries, but you can obviously use cultivated one. The honeysuckle's starting already because the weather's so good. Um, if you've got polytunnel, you'll have chickweed already too. Rosemary, there's just loads, you know. It's just coming into the stage of the year because the weather's so good where there's absolutely heaps of stuff. So <clears throat> I've made my online course half price because I know loads of people have lost their work or are facing financial uncertainty. And um, not least me, I have to say, when all this started, because I had to cancel every class for every country that I was due to teach in. So I teach in Ireland, but I also teach regularly in London as well. And uh, in other places, I'm supposed to be going to the States and Slovenia and all sorts of places this year, and it's all off. Um, so I made the course half price to help people because um, it's obviously a great time for people to learn and also I needed the income to keep everything online as well because it, it costs a lot of money to run an online course, they're not free. So if you're interested in this, back on my homepage again, go to the learn menu, online courses, um, and on this page, you're on this just now, a free introductory informal class. And if you would like the recordings from those, just remember to sign up for my newsletter and you'll get an email with the recordings of all the other ones we've done. But my video course I've showed you is called Learn with the Seasons, Forage for um, Medicinal and Edible Wild Herbs or something like that. <laughs> just click that button there and it will bring you on to the page with all the details about the course. There's, oh yeah, there's sea buckthorn, there's pesto, there's oxymels, there's, uh, there's just loads. Anyways, um, so the class, the course, you can either get a monthly subscription, which is usually 20 euros a month to keep access to the course, but that's uh, down to 10 euros a month just now because I've made everything half price, or you can buy the course outright and keep access to the content forever. I'm not promising to run webinars until the day I die, but the, you know, the videos and the documents and all the rest of it, you can download the documents, the videos I host, but you, you keep access to that hosting. So that's usually 245 euros, but it's half price just now, which is 122.50. So just click the button uh, for that and um, you'll come to the checkout screen, fill in your details. The checkout is via PayPal. You do not need a PayPal account to pay this way. If you check out and go to the PayPal screen, click the option to pay by credit or debit card and um, there's no need then to have a PayPal account. If you, it's just a secure method, which is great, you know, a secure method for processing credit and debit cards. And uh, if you select the monthly membership option, you will need to save your details with PayPal. That's what can charge you every month. Um, but um, if you don't have a PayPal account, I do recommend that you do it because um, it, it's great security for you, uh, the, the buyer, and you've got protection there. And all the banking systems have actually had to bring in a two-step thing like PayPal anyway. So, um, so it's it's a really good way to deal with online payments. That's it, I think. Um, I'm going to come back to your questions because I can see some of them have come in. 
Um, but uh, yeah, we're having a great time with the course just now. It's uh, it's lovely. I'm hoping to get more things into it this year. I've got lessons and things I want to add. I'm going to film a book review. I just got another delivery of books that arrived this morning, which is very exciting. And I want to share with you some of my favourite um, books and why I love them. Because this is such a huge topic. There's loads of different ways that you can go um, with, with this. Um, you might get really into medicine, you might be really into wild food, you might want to cultivate medicinal and edible herbs in your garden. It's just, you might be interested in the skincare. The other thing I'm teaching is I do teach a course for people who want to use herbs in professional natural cosmetics uh, and, and skincare products. And um, the next group for that starts tomorrow. I think there's only one place left in it. So if you're interested, if you're a natural skincare maker and want to make professional herbal extracts, that's the course for you. So um, that starts tomorrow. I'll send that round in the email as well. Um, who asked about rheumatoid arthritis? I just want to pick up on that. So rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease. So it, it's um, th that's internal treatment that tends to help more with, with rheumatoid arthritis. And um, I, I, elderflower isn't a plant that I wouldn't would necessarily think of using in a prescription for that. Um, but it's, it's more to do with autoimmunity and what's going on with the immune system there rather than general arthritis and rheumatism. It's, it's a different type of arthritis. Um, but it is something that um, I've treated a lot in my clinic and I've had um, certainly been able to help people with it. Um, but it's the sort of thing where you'd, you'd be better to attend a clinical herbalist where you live. Um, so I'll send around where to find the herbalist. That might be the best thing. I'll send that round. Uh, I'll send that round uh, with the email. I'm just writing that down. <clears throat> so I'm sorry to take so long to reply to your question. Whoever asked me that now, I've forgotten. Uh, thank you. It was super interesting. Feel confident to forage some elder for tea now. Great. Um, Oh, thanks for all that, Vivian. You're great. You have beautiful skin yourself. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> I didn't used to. <laughs> a good ad for all the teas you drink. I'm having either nettle or plantain tea every day now. Brilliant. And you'll really feel your energy increase because you're nourishing yourself better. You know, your energy really, really does pick up when you get into the habit of drinking them regularly. It makes such a difference. It's just like, a really good multivitamin and mineral because it's in such an absorbable form. It's great for you. I have a big pot at the beginning of the day. You and me both. I'll have to look at your ID video for elder tree as I still don't recognize the leaves. Okay, well, it will be there. It's one of those things you'll start to see it everywhere then. Um, you'll start to see it everywhere once you recognize it. Really enjoyed this. I look forward to next week. Great, I'm delighted. Um, thank you so much. You're welcome. It's lovely to have you here, Joe. It's really nice. Going out to get my elder now. Oh, wonderful about the monthly payment option. Great. Oh, you're very kind. I'm not reading all of that out. I was just going to blush. <laughs> oh, Chloe, you're here as well. Joe, Chloe is here. <laughs> Jenny's probably still on. Hi. <laughs> Thanks ever so much. You're just so well. Oh, you're really welcome. I thought I'd got to the stage where there were, there were a few of them. Um, Wow, I almost infused Pyransantha before realizing tree versus bush as looking similar. I don't know what that is. Which country are you in, Karina? UK. I don't know what that is. That a, is that a, a garden shrub? I'm rubbing. See, if they're just garden plants, I don't know what they are. I only know them if they're uh, medicinal or edible. I, I'm rubbish at ornamental plants. Um, yeah, if they just look pretty, I won't even know their name. <laughs> yeah, so be careful, yeah, yeah, with, with that. Identification is, is the first thing. The first rule of foraging is don't take something until you see somebody else take it first. And by somebody else, I mean someone who knows what they're doing, not somebody that you don't like that you're off to test it on. <laughs> Yeah, there are, so you're saying it's got white flower clusters and long green leaves, but a lot of cultivated plants will have, so it's not enough to, the, the flowers have got to be the right shape, they've got to grow in the right pattern, the petals have got to be the right shape, the leaves have got to be the right shape, otherwise you've got a different plant, you know, and I'm sure you could go into a garden centre and find lots of shrubs that have got white flowers, 
yeah 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 confused not infused yeah great yeah so everyone thanks ever so much for joining me and if you want to go in and learn more then the course is there and i hope you can join me for that and um, if not then you know see you another time where it suits you and um, thank you you are so welcome you are so welcome you're all really really welcome yeah i mean i've been teaching since 2004 and there didn't used to be anything like this interest and people used to think i was really odd and that it was a strange thing to do and that you were kind of trying to lie and trick people as well you know that you were sort of making things up or using uh you know there's there wasn't the respect that there that the, the respect for plant-based medicine is really coming back now and um you know loads of doctors and and chemists and pharmacists and researchers come to my classes and do my courses and it's just lovely to see how and i have done for years actually i have to say but it's lovely to see how much interest there is you know if you've got any kind of background in medicine or chemistry then you know plant chemistry is fascinating so um the potential of it is enormous and this is this is something I wanted to say at the beginning. This is our, look at everything we've looked at in these classes over the last 10 weeks and how abundant those plants are. And this is our environment trashed. Imagine what it could be like if we actually looked after it and worked with it. It could be just absolutely stunning, you know? So plants just grow and grow and grow. They adapt, they are abundant. It doesn't matter if people pull them up and put weed killer on them or tarmac the the ground or whatever the plants adapt and break through break through the the path you know and, and grow back so imagine what planet earth would be like and, and the life we could create uh, for all of us if we actually nourished and encouraged and treasured it and worked with it to enhance it you know nature isn't an object to be go, go and visit or an ornament to just have in the side of the room if when you understand that you are nature you're part of it and you are wildlife that's where it transforms you know and that you can not only not take from it but actually become a really positive part of the chain of of encouraging it that is transformative and that is where we transform life on planet earth for everyone and everything in it you know okay This is wonderful to find you. My great grandparents were the village herbalists and I only found this out recently. So it's in the genes. Isn't that wonderful? Wow. Lucky you. That's, that's wonderful. I highly recommend a whole foods plant-based diet. Yep. Yeah. The, well, certainly high, high in plants, you know, it makes such a difference. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks everyone for your time and I will process the recording and get it round to you with the air dryer and the um, <clears throat> the where to find a herbalist thing. Was there anything else I said? Thank you so much for your kind wishes, Vanilla. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'll say bye for now. Cheerio. And we'll probably, um, I can't seem to find the Facebook group or I can't remember my password. Could you email me, Cheryl, if you're doing the course, could you email me? I'll be at my desk this afternoon and I'll send you that. Yeah, because it's going to get lost in this video now anyway, because we're about to finish up. Um, so thanks ever so much for your time. We'll probably do Rosie's next week. They're my favourite. Rosie's are my favourite. Um, so they, the Wild Rose had just opened this morning where I live. Um, so yeah, see you then, hopefully. Cheerio. <laughs>